Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Ashman Family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Ashman Family JCC empowers you to experience Jewish paths toward a life of joy, purpose, and meaning through innovative Jewish learning and wellness programs, community building, and initiatives to develop the next generation of Jewish leaders. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 274, Beyond Binaries, Beyond Orthodoxies. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And today we continue our series talking to Jews of trans experience, which is a subject that's obviously really important for all kinds of reasons, but it's especially poignant this week because the new Pew study came out of the Jewish community. This is the second study that's been put out by the Pew Research Center looking at Jewish Americans. The first study came out in 2013, and this second study, which is called the 2020 study, is actually coming out in 2021. But in any event, one of the interesting and troubling dimensions of the Pew study this time around is that among the questions it asks those who fill out the survey is whether you are male or female, not leaving any space for the possibility that I neither identify with the male or the female gender. And that's a topic that we're going to talk about with today's guest and a topic that will come up frequently in this series. It's indicative of what we said last week, which is that these conversations with Jews of trans experience are relevant far beyond the question of trans experience itself. If our understanding of gender is changing, and our surveys aren't capturing that in time, then is the data that we're getting from those surveys really as helpful as it could be, or perhaps worse than that, if we're only studying whether the current Jewish world matches a previous Jewish world, and we're not able to really use the categories that actually define this Jewish world, what are we really studying? What are we really talking about? We're gonna definitely have a lot more to say about the Pew study in the weeks ahead, so stay tuned for that. And before we turn our attention to this week's interview, just want to mention briefly again that if you're listening to this podcast on the day that it comes out, Friday, May 14th, 2021, or the next couple of days, Saturday the 15th or Sunday the 16th of May, there's still time to join us for our Shavuot Live 30-hour Shavuot extravaganza of learning and conversation and thinking together. It starts at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday, May 15th, 2021, and it goes all the way through 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, May 16th. Go to www.judaismunbound.com slash Shavuot. That's S-H-A-V-U-O-T. We've already gotten well over 500 people registered. We're really looking forward to and excited about your joining us for that event. The event is absolutely free. But of course, we always appreciate donations at www.judaismunbound.com slash donate. Now let's welcome this week's guest. Our guest today is Jericho Vincent. They are a genderqueer post-ultra-Orthodox writer and lecturer. Their book, Cut Me Loose, which was published in 2014, describes their experience of struggling to live within ultra-Orthodox Judaism, ultimately leaving it, and the challenges and also triumphs that came after they left ultra-Orthodoxy. Following a journey through Buddhism, Sufism, and atheism, Jericho Vincent returned to Judaism to, as they put it, excavate timely wisdom and practices from their family's ancient traditions. They are currently a rabbinical student studying at Aleph, the Alliance for Jewish Renewal, which is actually where Lex recently received his rabbinic ordination. Previously, Jericho Vincent was a four-timer fellow at Harvard University, earning a master's degree in public policy with a focus on public narrative and adaptive leadership. They are also certified in internal family systems therapy coaching. Jericho Vincent's essays have appeared in a wide variety of publications, including the recently published anthology called Off the Derech, Leaving Orthodox Judaism, as well as publications like The New York Times, Salon, and The Daily Beast. They've been named to the Jewish Week's 36 Under 36 and by the Forward newspaper to its Forward 50 list of influential Jews. We are really thrilled to be having this conversation. So Jericho Vincent, welcome to Judaism Unbound. It's so great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm really excited to talk to you because I just finished reading your book, Cut Me Loose. Was it yesterday or this morning? I, don't know. I just finished it. So I, I was hoping just that 
uh, because I'm always conscious about like spoiler alerts that you could tell a little bit of your story just to get us started here in the way that you, you tell it so that people understand, you know, who you are and where you've come from and where you're going. Sure. So I published my memoir back in 2014. It's called Cut Me Loose. And it tells the story of my upbringing in an ultra-Orthodox rabbinic family and what happened when I started pushing back uh, against some of the rules of that lifestyle. Spoiler alert. It's not really a spoiler. I can tell you. What happened was pretty dreadful things. My family basically pushed me out and I was totally unprepared as an ultra-Orthodox teenager to live on my own in New York City, which is what I ended up doing. And I endured a lot of trauma um, as I tried to survive before finally starting to pull myself out of that and trying to rebuild a life, a stable, safe life. I mean, that's sort of the arc of the book. Um, and the arc of my life story is much larger than that. Um, yeah. We've had guests on this show who have left ultra-Orthodox Judaism. And in that book, you know, we, we could, if we were having this conversation some years ago, I think that's the conversation that we would have been having. But in the time since you published that book, you came out as trans, and I'm not sure exactly when that was in the timeline, so you could help us understand sort of where we're sitting today. And then down the road, what I'm really also really interested in is this connection, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't, a, a way to understand Judaism differently in light of the way that we are now understanding gender differently. Yeah, so I came out publicly about two and a half years ago. And I came out as genderqueer, which is under the umbrella of trans identity. And well, the thing about writing a memoir is that you discover when you sit down to write it, is that a human life is so massive and it contains so many narratives, you can only fit a very small sliver of that into a book. And when I actually sat down to write my memoir, I didn't know that I was genderqueer. Um, I had a very tortured relationship with gender, but I hadn't realized that that construct fit my identity. Part of that was because back then, you know, there's just been such an explosion of people talking about um, genderqueer identities, trans identities that really wasn't around, you know, five or 10 years ago. So when I wrote the story, I, I told one story. In fact, I very consciously told the story of being pushed out of my ultra Orthodox family and what happened afterwards through the voice of the child who had experienced that. That was really important to me that I wanted to give her a chance to speak because that experience had been very isolated and very lonely. Um, so I didn't provide a lot of context or rumination or commentary on that experience. I just really let her speak plainly and directly. But, you know, yes, if I sat down to write that story now and I told it from the vantage point of my life right now, there would be a lot to tell about how gender was a part of how I understood myself, how it was a part of my tension with ultra-Orthodox Judaism, and how it played an important role in me eventually leaving, even if I couldn't conceptualize it that way at the time. And now, so many years later, after leaving Judaism altogether, traveling through other faiths, I've come back to Judaism and I'm now a rabbinical student. And so gender is, at this point, in this engagement with Judaism, front and center. It's really central to how I think about God, how I think about my Jewish identity. Um, and it's become, making it front and center has allowed me to engage with Judaism in a way that feels wholesome and healthy and godly and true in a way that my early experiences with Judaism never could quite reach. Um, and so there was this parallel spiritual path that I don't talk about in the book um, that I always actually thought of as super private. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't make it into the memoir. It was easier for me to talk about sexual violence and trauma and my parents' abandonment than to talk about my relationship with God. The community I had been a part of had attacked that so viciously and said, you don't have a right to define your own Jewish identity. You don't have a right to define your own relationship with God. So I was wary of maybe sharing that in my writing. But after I left, I still had this longing, this spiritual longing. Uh, unlike a lot of my ex ultra orthodox friends, I had actually been a very devout child, a deep believer, and my relationship to God had been sort of central to my understanding of myself and the world. So being pushed out of that community was devastating on many levels, but devastating for that part of me. So I went kind of looking for a spiritual home, and I spent some time learning from Zen Buddhists, and that was really beautiful and helpful and important and very different than the kind of village education I'd gotten up to that point. But I wanted something a little more relational, a little more gritty, something, there was something missing for me. It wasn't enough. It was a useful tools in Buddhism and the tools I was encountered there, but I wanted something more. Um, and then somebody brought me to a Sufi mosque and I stepped into the mosque and I just fell in love with 
the ecstatic dancing and the chanting and the communal nature, you know, being raised as a girl, all the communal bonding, the the physical communal bonding of chanting and dancing and singing in the ultra Orthodox community is pretty much restricted to men. So I never encountered that. To step into a mosque and be able to like join the circle like any other human being in worship, it was transformative and ecstatic. I took hand, becoming a dervish. And then I left. I left that practice and was sucked into atheism for a while because I thought that as I was learning more about science in college, the wonders of science were like so much more magnificent than the construct of God. Having a sense of the cosmos, having a sense of physical reality was just so much bigger than this little God puppet that I'd been raised with that it was easy to relinquish the God puppet and take in the whole world. Um, and it's a long story, but eventually I decided that I had this calling to come back to Judaism and to come back to rabbinics, to come back to delving into the text and making them my own and being in relationship with my Judaism on my own terms, not letting anybody else decide that for me. I am really struck by what you said about how your relationship with God in certain senses felt more private and harder to talk about than sexual violence. We talk about God as this deeply privatized kind of realm and like it really becomes challenging to have any sort of theology that you state publicly because what it would look like for people to challenge that, what it would look like for people to question that. And in particular, because you've done so much incredible seeking, when you think of God, like what do you think of? Is is it, is it something where you say, ah, well, there's different names for God and some of them are masculine and some of them are feminine. And so in a sense, there's like a non-binary thread to be drawn there. Is it, well, maybe God doesn't have gender. Is it God is different genders at different times as opposed to sort of being non-binary at all times? Like, I'm curious how you would talk about any of that, because I sometimes sit with that myself theologically, but as somebody who does not identify as non-binary myself, it's done differently, I think. So how how does that theology play out for you today with the caveat that maybe it'll change in future years because that's that's how it goes? When I was in the process of coming out to myself, which happened very late in life, only maybe 45 years ago, I went to a writing conference called AWP. It's like the big writing conference all writers go to when they can. Um, and I went to an event that was trans writers talking about spirituality or something. It was named something more elegant than that. And I went and sat and listened to different trans, I think maybe they were all poets, talking about their identity as trans folk and spiritual writing and their relationship with the divine. And I came out of that room and I was there with my then fiance um, and just who followed me. And I just sat down in the hallway of the hotel and like burst into tears crying to be in a space with other trans folks who were openly talking about their relationship with the divine. It just, it was like the perfectly shaped key that just opened my heart. There's something mm. about community that affirms trans experience that lets people be their full self. That for me, let me enter as my full self. And then let me, in that, that simultaneous open talk about God, let me encounter God in a more full way. Um, I think whenever we talk about God, language always feels, you know, like Rumi said, like a tailor shop where nothing fits. It's all awkward, but trying to get at this thing. I was raised with a very male God. And then, you know, when I was older, after having left Judaism, you know, gravitated to feminine God language. And for me, I think of different genders as different ways of the different lenses of God. They don't cap the, none, no gender will cap the totality of God. Um, but it is, I am really interested in a meditative play where the person, whether they're genderqueer or cis or whatever, um, cisgendered, you know, not genderqueer or trans, plays with their own gender and plays with the gender of God. Like, I think if you are, I think, just a regular cis male guy, like you, Lex, right? Yeah. Um, and you think about God as male, like, how does that, what does that relationship feel like? And then if you imagined yourself as female and God male, what would that feel like? And then if you imagine yourself as genderqueer and God as genderqueer, what, and I feel like these questions go to the deep, deepest roots of our beings and can open up new ways of being for ourselves and new ways of being in relationship with the divine that can be quite transformative. In the same way that a lot of us, all of us perhaps, grew up 
with the notion of a gender binary that said you're you're either this gender or you're not or you're or you're the other gender and that means that if i don't feel that i'm gender a i must be gender b and that the whole idea of gender queer or um or 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 the various terminology that we would use to describe people who are elsewhere on a continuum between genders is something that most of us didn't grow up learning about, just in the same way that somebody who grew up Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox never learned really about that there's a continuum of kinds of Jews. They might have known that in theory, but not really. It's really there's good Jews and there's bad Jews, you know. And and I'm also thinking about the continuum between Jew and non-Jew, you know, and that most of us, even in non-Orthodox world, are basically grow up with this idea that you're either a Jew or a non-Jew. And after having done Judaism Unbound for the last five years, I'm really interested in 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 um, mucking up that that binary, you know, and in and really questioning that binary. And so I guess. I guess I'm wondering whether there there are in your mind insights from your own experience and understanding of both gender and having left ultra orthodoxy that that might actually capture really important philosophical ideas that that have broad application to Judaism and also of course beyond Judaism. I really love that comparison. Um, that's great. I think that for a lot of folks who leave ultra orthodoxy, having anything to do with Judaism. At, is just toxic. It's poison. And, you know, I definitely have gotten this many, many, many times, you know, when I was an atheist and the next part of the ex-ultra-Orthodox organizing community as an activist, they, you know, progressive Jews would say, oh, it's great that you left ultra-Orthodox Judaism, but you fast on Yom Kippur, right? And they were <laughs> devastated when I'd be like, nope, I don't. To force somebody to re-engage with Judaism when they've come out of that environment and have left at such huge cost would be horrifying and traumatic and dangerous. And I do see this parallel with some trans folk I know who come out as trans and they shed the identity they were assigned at birth. And to call them by the name they were assigned at birth would be an act of great trauma. And to remind them or or reference that previous gender incarnation would be traumatic. And I completely respect that. And I think that's a really important boundary not to tear down. And then I can speak to my personal experience that for me, and it's, it's definitely not universal, it's definitely unique to me, part of my healing has been about reaching back to all the people I've ever been and reincorporating them into myself. And so, yes, for me, the gender queer identity where I can be male, I can be female sometimes, and I can sometimes be something in between or neither, that lets me occupy all the people I've ever been in a way that feels healing to me. And my Judaism, like I... I get to be both a skeptic and a devout Jew and a Sufi and a Buddhist practitioner, like all these things that for me has been really healing and really fruitful, but I would never want it to be prescriptive to anybody else. I think, I do think that there's value in saying, Hey, this is a path. You should know that there is this possibility with gender. There is this possibility with Judaism. If it resonates with you and if it feels healthy to you, you know, come and explore, but also acknowledging that for some people, that's definitely not going to be the way to go. So you're in rabbinical school, and that's that matters. That's important. And so I'm curious, what is at play that makes you not only want to sort of be Jewish as you, but also through going to rabbinical school in some form, you know, guide the Jewishes of others? So that's number one. And then related to that, I'm curious you know, in rabbinical school, you do a lot of, you do a lot more seeking and questioning and engaging with different kinds of, not just theologies, but theologies and histories and otherwise. And so to bring back God language and God pronouns and God genders, how does that play out for you in this specific context of Jewish learning that you're in? I am very frustrated with where authority lies in the Jewish community. That Almost all Jews give enormous authority to Orthodox Judaism, ultra-Orthodox Judaism, canonical texts, and the people who claim to know this, the, the one and only interpretation of those texts. And I had this kind of epiphany a little while ago. I think that my ultra-Orthodox family thinks that God is dead because they're not looking for God in their lives right now. They're looking in these ancient books, like as if God only existed 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, and they've got to like bury through those texts to find him. I know in my life God is alive right now. 
And so when I see so much authority given to ultra-Orthodox Jews, many of whom right now are walking around maskless, you know, in the next neighborhood over from me, you know, putting the bubbies and zadies, the, the grandmas and grandpas at risk. People have died because of COVID. They're acting in ways that are blatantly against God's will in my own understanding of God. To see that somebody, that that community holds so much authority in Jewish life, there's a dissonance there that I find deeply disturbing. I love Judaism and I want what is true and wise and good about Judaism to thrive. And I don't think we've given the keys to the right gatekeepers. I don't think that we have given authority to the right places. And so I, you know, maybe this is the little zealot in me from my upbringing. Like, I want to speak for God. I want to speak for Judaism. I want to speak for our wise ancestors and say, whoa, 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 whoa. We have gotten some things terribly wrong. And for understandable reasons. I mean, from my perspective, the Holocaust plays a huge role here in warping and distorting what Judaism is and who has the authority to speak for it. But we have a moment to take a breath now in the freedom of our culture today and to look at, well, where is God? What is Judaism? How do we understand these things to build a healthy community and to act in ethical ways? And the moral imperative to be a warrior for that truth, to be passionate about that and to bring other people into that conversation, to me is unavoidable. You know, given the upbringing I have, given the viewpoint I have, I feel compelled to do this work. And as for gender in rabbinical school, the gender of God, the gender of the text, I, I am the nudge in class who often saying like, well, how do we say this bracha, this blessing with feminine God language instead of male God language? Or why are we all, you know, learning all these male texts and there isn't a single non-cis male voice here? You know, how can this be Judaism if we're only listening with half an ear to only the men? So even in the most progressive Jewish communities, I think there's a lot of work to do around this. And I feel really grateful that I'm in a rabbinical school that has been super receptive to those kinds of conversations. And people are really excited to engage in those conversations and expand our sense of, you know, what gender language we use around God and how we think about gender in these ancient texts. So diving for a second into some language stuff, I love looking at language. Um, the word for like the Hebrews in, in Hebrew <laughs> um, is Ivrim. And when you ask people what Ivrim means, they usually will say Hebrews, <laughs> which is true. But like it, it actually, this is not me bringing some like delicious hot take or twist. It means like transcenders or trans, like people who, I don't know, sort of travel between, like are between people. Which makes sense if you tie your history back to like wandering in a wilderness between Egypt and Israel. Like that's most of what the Torah is, right? Um, and I really want to sit with that. Like there's a core way in which trans as a term, not in the transgender term necessarily, but not, not in that way. There, there's a way in which that is actually part of one of the titles of this group that I'm a part of. The Hebrews, the Jews, whatever we are. And so... I want to sit with that and I want to tie it to your story a little and hear from you about that. Like we see ourselves as transcenders or I, I, I even use transgressors. How is it that we can actually under, understand ourselves as in-betweeners and how can non-binary people who on a day-to-day -day lived experience kind of level live that? How can your leadership help us flesh these kinds of questions out? I love that. I, I think that that's so true and so important. The Jews are in betweeners. We are Ivrim. There's so many places to take that, but where my mind goes right away is my first gender transition. So my first gender transition did not happen five years ago or two years ago. It happened when I left ultra orthodox Judaism, because I was an ultra orthodox girl, and then suddenly I was a secular girl or young woman, and those are not the same gender. And I didn't have queer theory. I didn't have feminism. I knew nothing. My brain was oatmeal. But I could experience like there was a real difference in the expectations and the taboos around what it was to be an ultra-Orthodox girl versus what it was to be a secular woman. You know, so as an ultra-Orthodox girl, like uh, there was this enormous preoccupation with modesty. And then as a secular woman, you know, I was pulled aside at one point by my somebody higher up in the company I was working at who said like, you really should be wearing makeup. 
he was really annoyed at me that he had to tell me this, like, why are you wearing makeup? Like that there was this expectation of sexual presentation that I was violating if I didn't meet, like there were taboos around that. I was aware that I was transitioning, that my gender had to change and that it was different and that there were different rules around it. It can illuminate something about how gender is so socially constructed and perhaps um, appreciating that can give us a little more freedom to move out of whatever gender box we may have been assigned into a more expansive sense of who we are. I think my question connects to what you just said and also to what you were saying before. I was trying to think about who are the Jews? And it's occurring to me as I'm thinking about this that maybe it's also very connected to this question of gender. But I feel like in traditional Judaism, and I don't only mean Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox, I mean the traditional way that we Jews have thought about Judaism up till relatively recently, if not still in many cases, it's like the Jews are a particular set of people. They are genetically related to one another, and they also have a certain set of practices and beliefs and whatever that they're supposed to do, in which case the stakes are very high if one of them tries to leave, right? Then we, we have to desperately try to hold on to them because we only have a limited set of possible Jews that are out there. Now, yes, it's possible to convert also to Judaism, but we don't pursue that. That's not something that we do. We don't proselytize. Again, I'm giving the traditional uh, mindset here. And so we get very nervous about people moving in different directions because those two things are very much tied together. And it strikes me that there's a way in which sex and gender have been understood that way as well. To, to be a woman means you have two X chromosomes. And so therefore it's a very limited category. It's, it's you know, and, and, and so if there's a person with two X chromosomes who's kind of acting in a way that we see as male, that makes us very nervous and we have to stop that. And that's very, you know, and at the point at which those things start to be disconnected, it's both very liberating to people and it allows people to live their real life. But I'm also wondering if there's a way that we see as a positive that somebody might leave Judaism, go to Buddhism, go to Sufi Islam, and then kind of come back and become a new kind of rabbi, that we also have to see it as positive and possible that all kinds of people will come who didn't start off Jewish through those pathways and find the Jewish stuff really attractive. And on the flip side, that there will also be lots of people who are born Jewish and they go off to Sufi Islam and they stay there. And that's fine because that's the right place for them. And so it kind of feels like there's a possibility here. And maybe, again, it's something that Judaism can learn that would actually make Judaism turn into something quite different from what it's been in the past and better. I think the reason why we don't want people leaving Judaism has to do with trauma, has to do with the fact that Jews were not allowed to leave Judaism for so long, and that the punishments for Jews who tried to leave Judaism were so severe by the external world. And I think the memory of that traumatic boundary has been sort of digested by us and become part of our skeleton. But I think that rigidity has a lot more to do with anti-Semitism, historical anti-Semitism, and the trauma of that then it, I don't really think it's a necessary part of keeping Judaism alive. I don't think we keep Judaism alive by not letting people leave. I don't think that's necessary. And then this is kind of tricky territory, but the question about who gets to, what does it mean to become a Jew? I think a lot about the opposing tension between gender and race. We understand today that people can have a deep felt sense of their gender that is different than the one that their community gave them. And we honor as completely true and authentic, whatever gender they affirm to us. It is not the same for race. You know, somebody who is white, comes from a white family, and says, listen, my deep soul truth is that I'm African American. Like, that is not acceptable. We understand on some deep level that ethically that doesn't work. And I think a lot of it has to do with our understanding of the historical experience of being part of a certain ethnic community is not easily adopted by an outsider. And there, there is a lot of very painful, troubled politics about in this particular case, white people reaching into African American culture and cannibalizing it and taking, you know, misusing it, things like that. So whenever I think about people who join Judaism, I always feel the tension between those two different models. Like, what does it mean to become a part of a people that have been for, you know, maybe 95% of our existence deeply profoundly oppressed and now 5% are not oppressed? You know, what are the responsibilities of joining? A people with this history? How do you make sure that you are honoring that heavy history in a way that I think does need to be honored, even if we keep those borders open, as I think we should, to people who feel called to Judaism? So I think these issues are messy, 
and touchy. And I think we should give them a lot of space to let that messiness and touchiness kind of be honored as we try to sort them through. One frustration I have generally, not just with Jews and Jewish communities on this, but with like society, is that I sometimes feel that LGBTQ is like a one syllable word. We just sort of like say it in one big mouthful. And there's a lot to do with like each letter of that equation. And like, if your space's approach to L and G and B and T and Q things is to have like an LGBTQ Shabbat or an LGBTQ program, like I find that a lot of the time what gets prioritized in those conversations has been the L and the G, questions of of sexual orientation more than T and Q. And um, also, by the way, more than the B, more than bisexuality, which I think, you know, deserves a, a whole deep dive podcast of its own that we'll come back to at some point. But generationally, a lot, a lot of folks did, like even me, you know, I'm not on the older end of society yet, but like I didn't grow up with any notion of queerness in the sense of gender queerness. So I think there's like more comfort with hosting a program or having a Shabbat where we're talking more about sexual orientation. And also for so long, like the main fight on any of these issues was marriage equality, specifically around same-sex marriage, which that's not every issue. So I, I guess I I really want to hone in on the Q. And I actually want to ask, I don't know if this is a strange question or not, but like when you are in a space doing work actually with others in that umbrella or when you're in Jewish spaces where there's a lot of different kinds of people with different sexual orientations of different racial backgrounds, et cetera, like what are some of the challenges or opportunities that come up specifically from the axis of being non-binary, of being genderqueer? Like what is it that comes out there that might not even be the same as, say, a trans woman who identifies as a trans woman or a trans man who identifies as a trans man? Like, how can we really hone in on some of the challenges that come up when we're really focused on work that's not just sort of LGBTQ in a big sense, but specifically, you know, in solidarity with genderqueer folks? I think to answer that question, you have to go back to the beginning of your question, which is why why are we inclusive? Are we? What does it mean, LGBTQ? Like, what are we trying to do with that block? Are we trying to make people who are belong to each of those identities feel comfortable in our spaces? Like that is that is a great bar to try to reach that many people haven't read, reached. But I want something even more than that. I want the belief that we engage in diversity and inclusivity because we think that the folks who've been marginalized, whose experiences are outside the spoken norm, have unique and important perspectives for all of us. As a genderqueer person, I mean, certainly, you know, if people are, don't know how to use gender neutral pronouns, uh, so my pronouns are they and them. And in a lot of spaces, Jewish spaces, other spaces, people, especially older people, haven't seemed to have gotten over that. And it, it is... There is a significant difference for me if people use my right pronouns or don't use my right pronouns, or when people are talking about human beings in general to acknowledge men, women, and then to have that thing for non-binary folks. Like there is this little kind of ripple of discomfort when a teacher or a lecturer or a friend or anybody will kind of talk about the whole human race and say, "Well, men and women, blah 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 blah," um, and and not. And then I, 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 you know, I think we don't even realize that we find ourselves in those little idioms. And when you don't find yourself, there's kind of this rude, like, oh, wait, where am I? Why am I not part of this? Um, and, you know, of course, in rabbinical school, I'm learning a lot of life cycle stuff that's very gendered. Um, there's this accommodation that's being done to make sure that gay and lesbian folks feel included. But it is a little trickier to work with gender queer folk. And I think that it is an emerging conversation because we're having emerging awareness that this is a growing and essential population that we have to accommodate. And again, like I want to have the voices of genderqueer folk brought into these conversations, not just as fragile people that need to be protected, but as valuable oracles because they have a unique perspective that can enlighten all of us. You know, from the gender perspective, something I'm very passionate about as a Jew is listening for the voices that didn't make it into the canon because they are Torah, they are our wise ancestors, and often, paradoxically, those who are most excluded are the ones we need most in this moment right now. Um, and so a, a lot of my teaching and writing right now is about 
hunting down those voices, listening really hard, trying to hear them, trying to draw them in, both so that we have a fuller picture of where we come from and so that genderqueer folks today can feel connected to their roots, but also so that every person, every Jewish person or any person engaged with Jewish Torah, no matter their gender identity, can have um, a more expansive understanding of where we come from and what our Torah lineage actually is. Um, one of the voices that I'm really interested in is the feminine God voice that was beloved by our great, 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 great grandmothers and really offensive to some of the great, great, great grandfathers we have who wrote the canonical books that we consider. Um, and I think that it's a really important spiritual archaeology to go back and to unearth that goddess image, the Asherah image, the image of the tree of life that our ancestors, our wise female ancestors, were devoted to and reclaim it and say, this too is a way to God. And I think that can enhance the Judaism of everybody or to think about the gender of God overall. Like what does it do to our worship or to our devotion or to our Jewish practice if we imagine God as female or if we imagine God as male or if we imagine God as gender queer. And just as interestingly, no matter what our gender is, whether we're trans or cis or gender queer, what happens when we imagine our gender to be different than the gender it actually is? Does that open up anything new for us in our relationship with God? So I think there's a lot of interesting play to do that I want to kind of push forward. One of my favorite articles is by somebody who identifies as a Viking Jewess, Jewess, J-E-W-E-S-S. And I bring it up because going back to the conversation that you hinted at about how for you in writing your memoir, it was really important to let her, your childhood her, um, now you use they, them pronouns, but you used her there, to let her speak. And I tie it to this article, not because the author is trans as far as, I mean, she doesn't say she's cis, but she says nothing about what her gender background is, but because I think she pushes us in a sense about how we understand childhood experiences that in one way or another we're leaving. So she did not grow up Jewish and she converted to Judaism. She then had kids and she is tied to Northern Europe and feels a deep connection to Norse gods. And she mentions at the close of her article that the middle names of some of her children are Thor and Odin. And that's and she named them after she converted to Judaism as she lives a, a deeply observant Jewish life. And I bring that up because I felt some echoes of that in how you were talking about a, a part of yourself that you like you've left or, ultra orthodoxy. But I mean, we use that word left kind of casually, I think, right? Like the assumption is, ah, you're living in a community and like physically you actually like leave it and you live somewhere else and you form a different kind of life. So you've left. But there's a way in which I hear from you, like, you didn't leave all of it. And there's parts of you that are still anchored in that, that you, that you will reflect on and that, will, that, that are part of your work today. And so how do you continue to draw on those earlier Jerichos, those earlier versions of the current you in the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, the particular ultra-Orthodox community I grew up in is called the Yeshivish community. And if you ask me, I'll tell you, I'm still yeshivish. You know, I might be pretty paganistic, pretty progressive, but uh, I'm still yeshivish. There are pieces of me that are part of that. And the only way I could not be that is by circumcising those pieces of me. And I'm not a fan of doing that. Like, I'm not going to, um, I have tried letting go of pieces of who I am and have found that for me, it is healthier to always hold on to them. Um, so, you know, whether it's certain foods or certain music that are still part of my life, you know, every Friday night, we light Shabbos candles, me and my genderqueer partner, who is not Jewish, with my two kids, and we sing, you know, the Good Shabbos song, the Yiddish Good Shabbos song that I grew up on. And to me, like, that is pure, perfect Judaism, my non-Jewish partner singing the Yiddish Good Shabbos song along with me and my two kids. Because, you know, we talked about before, what is Judaism? I think Judaism is something that's evolving and that pulls in things from surrounding cultures. In fact, I think some of the things that we think of as most Jewish are things that come in from outside cultures. And so, you know, that, I think that weaving of different parts of who we are is a really important part of keeping Judaism Jewish and vibrant. Um, one piece of the weaving that's really important to me is I have a deep attachment to the ancient Greek gods. Um, and that is an essential piece of my Judaism. And I feel deeply connected to our ancient ancestors 
who were deeply Jewish and deeply devout to uh, some relationship with the ancient Greek gods. Um, and I, I think of all these things as really core to what it means to be Jewish. It's this weaving of different cultures, different ways of being that keeps Judaism vital and strong and holy. I wonder a little bit, especially for somebody who has come out of ultra-Orthodoxy and also experienced some of the real negative consequences of growing up in that society. The goal is to not let anybody leave. But when somebody does leave, they're in a very bad situation because they haven't been prepared. And and I sort of end up wondering about the ethics of that. Like, do, is, do you have a take on when for example, Jewish federations say, you know, we want to support all Jews, you know, and they, they give a lot of money to the ultra-Orthodox world just because they're Jews too, or the state of Israel does that. I wonder whether you would have a take that says, actually, we shouldn't be promoting this as a alternative way to be Jewish that's just as good as any other, that actually we, we want to insist on changes within the ultra-Orthodox world, or we shouldn't actually support Inst Jewish institutions supporting that world because it's actually doing damage to people. You know, I think about how everybody's sort of okay with having a Chabad house in your local secular neighborhood because, you know, you don't want to go, you don't have to, but like let them, let them, uh, you know, be around to offer that alternative. But if anybody opened a secular Judaism house in Borough Park, there would be, everybody would be up in arms and, and there would be a lot of pressure to sort of close that down. You know, that strikes me as, as not a situation that sort of has ethics on its side. I'm, I'm wondering what you think about all that. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. I think it speaks to this larger issue that progressive folks have, that we've relinquished moral authority to the most conservative members of our society and are terrified to make a moral or ethical judgment. And I think it's a travesty. Progressive folks are representing essential morals and ethics and should not be afraid to claim that authority. And every, every community has its problems. But I was raised in this one community, and so I feel pretty knowledgeable and pretty passionate about the problems it has. And it is very frustrating to me that liberal Jews are significant supporters of these communities and don't seem to understand, as you put it, the ethical implications of supporting them. And, you know, the ones that really bother me the most are the treatment of women, the way that sexual violence is dealt with in that community, and the way that community does not allow people to leave, leave the community. Um, I don't have a problem with the way that ultra orthodox people dress, the way they pray, the way they practice. Like, I think it's a beautiful way of life. I think there's a lot that's compelling about it. I respect its right to exist and want to see it flourish. But because I respect it and because I want to see it flourish, it's my responsibility to point out these gaping flaws, these massive problems that I think we have to um, grapple with. You know, there. I, I just think that it is our responsibility as ethical people to not turn a blind eye to the suffering of ultra-Orthodox Jews who are stuck in these situations, the children, the women, the people who want to leave. You know, what ultra-Orthodox Jews will often say is like, don't tell us, you know, that we are not happy doing what we're doing. Don't come in here and try to interfere and change things. We love our life exactly how it is. Don't try to change us. And for me, the big test is like, well, what would be the consequence if you told me that you were not happy with the cover-up of young children who are sexually you know, violated? Like, what do you actually have the right to say anything other than what you're telling me right now? And if telling me, hey, actually, there's some major problems in this community that need to change will result in your kids being kicked out of school and you losing your marriage and your children and your job, you know, maybe I don't take you at face value. And I think there has to be that kind of skepticism brought to these affirmations by members of the community that things are perfect in the way they are, that they are actually not in a position to freely speak. And the people who do take the risk of speaking are saying like, hey, you got to look at this community. There are some big problems that nobody's looking at, nobody's addressing. You need to address them. Thank you so much, Derek Vincent, for joining us. This has been such an important conversation, and we're grateful that you could be here with us. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you guys about all of these wonderful things. And thank you so much to all of you out there for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and we hope that you'll tune in again in the future. We want to remind you uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, Saturday night, May 15th begins Shavuot Live, our 30-hour extravaganza of digital Jewish learning. We would love to see you there. You can join the festivities by registering at either judaismunbound.com slash Shavuot, that's S-H-A-V-U-O-T, 
or jewishlive.org slash Shavuot, same spelling. Uh, either of those will get you registered. We have over 500 people who have signed up so far, and we know for sure that the presenters that are coming are just so talented, so wise, full of Torah, and you don't want to miss this. Um, we want to close this out by encouraging you to be in touch with us too, and there are a wide variety of ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, our Instagram, or our Twitter. All of those handles are at Judaism Unbound. You can go to our website, JudaismUnbound.com. And you can, of course, email us at Dan at JudaismUnbound.com or Lex at JudaismUnbound.com. The last request we like to make is that we deeply appreciate when listeners are able to support us with a financial donation. And you can do that on either a monthly recurring basis or just as a one-time gift at JudaismUnbound.com slash donate. So thank you so much for listening. And with that, this has been... Judaism Unbound.